Insects are all around us. Globally distributed, diversified across nearly all terrestrial habitats, and believed to number in the quintillions. They're considered some of the most successful organisms on the planet, and they've survived nearly everything the Earth could throw at them, from asteroid to ice age. So how'd they get to be so dominant? And do we really have to worry about their decline after all they've been through? Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the class Insecta, better known as the insects. Since we finished covering all 28 orders of insects, I felt we needed to take a step back and cover this group as a whole. Insects have been buzzing about on Earth for over 400 million years, back in the early Devonian period. The vertebrates at this point were adamantly in the water. I guess they weren't buzzing about because they didn't evolve wings until the Carboniferous. This means that not only are insects ancient, they've survived four of the big five mass extinctions. Each one of these extinctions are believed to have knocked out 75 to 95 percent of species. So clearly they're doing something right. And despite their alien-like appearance, insects did not just fly in on some distant asteroid. They had to have evolved from somewhere. So bear with me, but let's talk a bit about insect evolution and where they fall on the taxonomic tree of life. First off, there are three taxa, the Columbula, the Protura, and the Diplura, that used to be considered insects, but now are not. This is important because these, plus the insects, comprise the subphylum Hexapoda. Now, we're going to talk about the origin of the Hexapoda, which consequently is the origin of the Insecta. Surely this is the content you came for. Originally, the Hexapoda were believed to be most closely related to the Myriapoda, the centipedes and the millipedes and such. However, it's now better supported that they're off in the crustacean side of the family tree. Crustaceans are taxonomically a nightmare, probably not monophyletic, that is, derived from a single common ancestor, and insects seem to be somewhere in that pocket. So there was this ancestor of the crustaceans and the hexapoda that diverged into a bunch of these different niches and taxa. And we call this big grouping of the hexapods and crustaceans the pancrustacea. Within the pancrustacea, hexapoda's closest living relative seems to be the xenocarida, which is composed of the remipedia and the cephalocarida. But some people say that the Xenocarida is not monophyletic, and the closest living relative is either the Remipedia or the Cephalocarida. So take from that what you will. That's enough of that. So what even is an insect? Well, there's a ton of diversity and variability in this group, being that there's over a million described species, but there still are some traits that are shared across all groups. Like other arthropods, insects have a hard, chitinous exoskeleton, jointed appendages, and segmented bodies. The name Insecta actually comes from the Latin insectum, meaning to cut up, referring to how they're divided into segments. Insect bodies are broadly separated into three regions, or tagmata, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. This is as opposed to, say, spiders, which have two tagmata. All of the legs and wings are going to attach at the thorax, that middle region there. Speaking of legs, insects have six of them. Most insects will also have wings. Though there are two orders that never evolved them, some groups evolved them and then lost them, and immature stages don't have wings either. So it's not surefire, but wings are a very unique trait. If you see an arthropod and it has wings, you can immediately know it's an insect. In fact, they're also the only invertebrates with true wings. Unless you count, like, sea butterflies flying through the ocean. Insects also have compound eyes and antennae to sense their environment. Compound eyes for visual, and antennae for chemical and mechanical. You can also find small holes on the sides of insects called spiracles. This is how they breathe. Air enters into the spiracles and through a webbing of trachea that disperses oxygen throughout the body. A lot of these traits are not unique to the insects, but in conjunction with one another can help you narrow it down. Another fascinating aspect of the insecta is metamorphosis. There are three main types of metamorphosis. The first is holometaboly, or complete metamorphosis. This is a four-stage metamorphosis going from egg to larvae to pupae 
to adults. This includes butterflies and beetles and the like. The second is hemimetaboly, or incomplete metamorphosis, going from egg to nymph to adult. So they lack a pupil stage. Think of dragonflies and grasshoppers and such. The third is ametaboly, which means without metamorphosis. So they still go from egg to juvenile to adult, but there really isn't much distinction between juvenile and adults outside of sexual maturity, and they still continue to molt even after reaching maturity. The only ametabolous orders are the archaeognatha and the zygentoma. We may take it for granted, since we learned about caterpillars and butterflies back in second grade, but metamorphosis is an incredible feat of evolution. Especially in the holometabolous insects, it allows completely different evolutionary pressures to act on different stages of life. So larvae can be optimized for feeding and growth, and the adults can be optimized for reproduction and maybe movement. It also means that the adults and the larvae no longer have to compete with one another. Take the Lepidoptera, for example. The caterpillars can go about their day munching leaves, and the butterflies can stick to nectar. No competition between life stages. Some adults don't even have mouth parts, and just put all their stat points into making babies. But the life of an insect isn't all rainbows and lepidopterans. They have plenty of obstacles set out for them, and they had plenty of evolutionary obstacles as well. One of those hurdles was desiccation, or drying out. Insects have a high surface area to volume ratio because of their size, which means they lose water pretty quickly, so they had to come up with ways to conserve that water. The exoskeleton is a huge help in holding on to the water they already have. They also use a lot of uric acid excretion to get rid of toxins and excess nitrogen, as opposed to like urea excretion, or urine, like we do. This is because urea and ammonia excretion needs heavy dilution, Uric acid excretion is solid. It's more metabolically expensive, but it's oftentimes worth it to save the water. The development of a specialized corian in insect eggs to prevent water loss was also crucial to allow terrestrial egg laying. Prior to that, all the eggs had to be laid in water. But this small size also comes with some benefits. Insects seem to be the perfect size for niche partitioning, where they can diversify and occupy a wide range of niches and microhabitats without competing with one another. For example, you can have one insect in the leaves of a tree, another one in the bark, another one feeding on the roots, another one parasitizing the one on the leaves, another one parasitizing the one parasitizing the one on the leaves, etc. Perhaps an oversimplification, but you get the point. However, their small size means a lot of things like to eat them. Like most things that eat meat like to eat them and they'll also eat each other. But they aren't defenseless. Insects have found various strategies to defend against their many, many predators. One common strategy is chemical defense. Insects will sequester toxins from their food to make themselves poisonous and distasteful. A common example of this is the monarch butterfly. Others will instead go the venom route. Because why wait to be eaten to poison your predator when you can take initiative and inject venom into them yourself? Social hymenopterans are famous for this, like the ants, bees, and wasps, and then you've also got, like, the venomous caterpillars and such. And some insects went the mad scientist route and decided to mix chemicals that explode out of their abdomen in a scalding spray. Very creative, Bombardier beetles. Some insects will reflex bleed, where they ooze hemolymph, basically the insect equivalent of blood, as a defense mechanism. You can see this in the frog hoppers and ladybugs. Others use physical defenses, such as tough armor in a lot of beetles, thick hairs in caterpillars, spines on some of the katydids, or slippery scales like silverfish. Some insects will avoid conflict altogether by blending in with their environment. We call this crypsis. Phasmids, the stick and leaf insects, are a classic example of this. Instead of disguising yourself as a stick, you can also disguise yourself as a different, more dangerous insect or predator. Chemical defenses can be metabolically expensive, so if you can get away with pretending to have one instead, pretty sweet deal. Other insects rely on their movement, like cockroaches and their fast scurrying, flies and their quick reflexes, or jumping bristletails and their, well, jumping. But there are also abiotic factors that insects have to watch out for. Temperature can be a pretty big issue, especially for those that live in seasonal regions. 
Many insects will wait out the winter, tucked away in soil or leaf litter or logs or whatever other shelter they can find. Different species will do this at different life stages. Some overwinter as adults, nymphs, pupae, or even eggs. They'll enter a period of diapause, where their metabolism slows down and they kind of just wait for the winter to end. Insects in hotter regions will sometimes do this to avoid the dry season. Other insects will migrate, the most famous of which being the monarch butterfly. But as technology and monitoring techniques advance, we're seeing that this is a lot more common than we once thought, with trillions of insects migrating across the UK alone. So as you can see, insects make do. And do they shall. Insects do many things. One could even say they do most things in some form or another. And lots of it. What? You've got the insect herbivores, from leaf munchers to bark burrowers to root ravagers to flower and fruit feasters. Not to mention the gall feeders, stimulating the plants to create a growth of tissue for the larvae to feed on. Basically a plant tumor. Then you've got the predators, many of which feed on other arthropods, though the occasional vertebrate does end up on the menu. And don't forget the parasites, with some parasitizing vertebrates, others parasitizing other insects, others still parasitizing other parasites of the other insects. You get the point. Then you've got the detritivores, feeding on carrion or other dead organic matter, like leaf litter, rotting wood, or dung. All this to say that insects have diversified themselves across a whole host of niches across ecosystems worldwide. But they haven't just found these niches in the woods and mountains. They've found plenty of open real estate in our homes and farms as well. Due to there being millions of insect species, it's only to be expected that we don't exactly get along with all of them. For example, those that steal our blood and spread deadly pathogens as a thank you. Mosquitoes are the poster child for this, and for good reason. Some estimates believe that mosquito-borne diseases have killed half of all humans that have ever lived, around 50 billion or so, malaria being the main culprit. And don't forget the Black Plague spread by fleas that decimated Europe, and there's plenty of other examples. Insect vector diseases have changed and directed history at a level that's hard to fathom. T.C. Weingard has a great book on this. And they still are making a huge impact, with an estimated 700,000 people dying to insect-borne diseases annually. The other big conflict with insects happens on our farmland. Pest species result in 20 to 40% crop losses every year, and we spend billions annually to try to keep these agricultural pests in check. And they've been the cause of plenty of famines throughout history. Sometimes this is in very direct ways, such as plagues of locusts. But other times, like the bloodsuckers, it's in the diseases they spread. Insects vector hundreds of plant diseases, some of which can wipe out entire fields if they're not kept in check. A lot of these particularly nasty pests are invasive, meaning they've been introduced into regions to which they're not native. Freedom from their local predators and parasites can create large outbreaks and consequently, heavy damages. Oftentimes, the plants aren't very well equipped to defend against them either. These invasive species can wreak havoc in our natural ecosystems as well. Argentine ants and fire ants continue to conquer large swaths of land outside their native range. Spongy moths munch away at our native foliage. And the emerald ash borer has basically decimated U.S. ash tree populations. It's a Pandora's box with these critters. Once there, you can't really get rid of them completely only control their numbers. You've also got the household pests, like cockroaches and termites and such. But enough of the negatives. Here's the deal. Despite all of this, we can't live without insects. I don't care how icky they might look to you, or how scared they make you feel, or that you got stung by a bee one time in third grade and still haven't gotten over it. You're allowed to dislike them. You're allowed to find them gross. You're allowed to have negative experiences and share those experiences. I'd love to hear about them. But you can't pretend you can live without them, that you don't need them, that their fate isn't inherently linked to your own. Insects make the world go round. And this isn't bias for my field. It's fact. The classic example of this is pollination. Most flowering plants, in some form or another, rely on insects to reproduce. They also aerate soil, disperse seeds, cycle nutrients back into the soil, and other critical ecosystem functions that support healthy plant communities. No insects, plant communities crumble, food web falls apart. Insects are also critical in nutrient cycling. 
taking foliage and other vegetative matter and turning it into high quality animal protein. And this isn't just the living vegetation. It's also the hard to process detritus like rotting wood, leaf litter, and dung. I mean, caterpillars alone pass on more plant energy than any other animal taxon. We can see a great example of this in our avian populations. 70% of songbirds rely on insects, and a single clutch of chickadees needs six to 9,000 caterpillars to fledge. So we don't just need insect diversity, we need them in abundance as well. The problem is, this abundance is dropping fast. Multiple long-term studies have shown intense decline across many insect groups in multiple continents. 33% drop in Ohio butterflies across 21 years. 20% drop in Scottish moths. A tenfold decrease in arthropod biomass in a Puerto Rican rainforest. And the study that made it to the main stage, Hallman et al. 2017. 75% decrease in flying insect biomass in 63 locations across Germany spanning 27 years. The scary part is, is that these studies weren't done in a forest that was then paved into a parking lot. Many of these were in a similar state to when they were first sampled. In the Hallman et al. study, those 63 sites were protected natural areas. So what do we do? Well, insects need more habitat and more food. And if you have land, you have the power to provide both. The great part about insect conservation is that you can make a visible impact even with a tiny plot of land. You may not be able to reintroduce wolves to the lot behind your townhouse, but you can reintroduce a healthy insect community. Take all that lawn grass you aren't using and plant native plants. Emphasis on native. Don't plant something from like two continents over. The insects can't really make use of that. Look at what plants are native to your region and plant accordingly. The good news is, since they're local to your region, they shouldn't require too much upkeep. When I was in high school, I took a small plot of land, like seven feet by five feet, and planted a native flower garden. And I was in a suburban neighborhood with lawn grass everywhere and maybe a few non-native trees sprinkled in. However, after planting, the insect abundance and diversity I saw was staggering. I remember one day going out and counting 30 monarch caterpillars in that tiny plot. A few years after the Hallman et al. study released, Nat Geo did a cover article titled, You'll Miss Them When They're Gone covering the drop in insect abundance. The amount of people on social media replying, no we won't, was staggering. I just hope that we can learn to compartmentalize our negative feelings for some insects and accept our reliance on them as a whole. Anyways, thank you all so much for listening. I felt we needed a more general insect video to round things out after covering all the orders, so I appreciate you taking a watch. If you like the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future videos. And if you have any fun entomology facts or any favorite groups or species, or just any stories related to the Insecta, whether fond memory or nightmare, please leave them in the comments below. I always love reading them. Peace, y'all.